As that story demonstrated, climate change will be a key election issue next year. With me from Canberra is the opposition leader, Anthony Albanese. Thanks very much for being with us. Good evening, Leigh. A 2030 emissions reduction target. When will you announce yours and will it be more than 35 per cent? Uh, we'll announce it uh, in, in good time. It'll certainly be announced before the end of this year. Uh, the government, of course, waited a long period of time before they produced their pamphlet. And in the end, it's just a vibe, really. There's no real plan uh, to get to net zero by 2050. We've already got a lot of policy out there. We've got our policy to transform electricity transmission system, our rewiring the nation plan. We have our net zero by 2050. We have our community batteries plan, our new energy apprenticeships plan and our national reconstruction fund, which will help industries to transform, to take advantage of the opportunities which are there. Will that get you over 35% reduction? Well, we'll announce all of all of our policies. One of the things that we're not doing, Lee, is deciding on a figure and then working back. What we're doing is the opposite. What we're doing is working out what good policy is going forward, how we take the opportunity that is there to create jobs, lower energy prices whilst lowering our emissions, and we've announced a range of policies. We'll have more to come before the end of the year. The former Treasurer, Wayne Swan, noted um, that in recent times you've seen many of Labor's old working class and lower income voters won over by the populist right, and we saw just now how that's playing out potentially in Queensland. How can you counter that trend but also meet the expectation uh, of your progressive inner city uh, Sydney and Melbourne voters who you could otherwise lose to the Greens? Well, Labor will always stand up for the rights of working people. I've got a a bill in the parliament now for same job, same pay. One of the things that's happening in the mining sector, but in other sectors as well, is that labour hire companies are paying up to $40,000 less than people who are permanent employees for the same job. We'll have secure work at the centre of our agenda. Secure work, dealing with issues like casualisation, dealing with people who are in the gig economy, helping to close the gender pay gap, 10 days paid domestic and family violence leave, making sure that permanent work is an objective of the Fair Work Act. We'll have a much fairer, more secure work at the centre of our offer at the next election. Your shadow climate change minister, Chris Bowen, noted after the 2019 election that people of faith in areas like his seat no longer feel, quote, that progressive politics cares about them. Where does that leave Labor in terms of the religious freedom bill? Well, we'll examine uh, the details uh, after the committee that we'll, we'll look at it. My view, Lee, and Labor's view is that people of faith should be respected. Uh, they should be able to practise their faith uh, and they should have those rights without rights being taken away from other people. Let's whip around a few other issues that are likely to be prominent in the election campaign. On COVID, what's known so far about the latest variant is that it's not really making people particularly sick. At least two of the four cases in Sydney have no symptoms whatsoever. The national vaccination rate in Australia is about 90%. Isn't there a risk here of unnecessary panic and overreaction if states start closing borders and so on again? Well, we need to have a measured response, but we also need to apply the precautionary principle here, Lee. Uh, we've seen in the past, for example, in Sydney, when Scott Morrison encouraged Gladys Berejiklian to not uh, close down activity, uh, we saw that spread from a single uh, driver taking someone to hotel quarantine in Sydney spread throughout the entire country and lockdowns at great cost have to be imposed as a result of that policy failure. Uh, what we need to do is to have a, a, a sober and measured response, but uh, this has once again uh, shown that we should have had in place purpose-built quarantine by now. The idea that we would return to hotel quarantine when it's been responsible for more than 20 breaches that have had real consequences for the economy uh, just shows a failure to have that foresight. On housing affordability, people always talk about Sydney and Melbourne, but you look at Tasmania, you look at Brisbane, you look at regional New South Wales. Uh, for years, you've seen housing prices going up 4%, 8%, some markets 20%. Wages, though, over decades have barely moved out of that kind of 1-2% range. What is the answer to that situation? 
Well, real wages, of course, have fallen under this government and they've been projected to fall over the coming four years. Uh, we need to address people's standard of living. Part of that, of course, is housing. One of the things that we will do is increase housing stock by investing in social housing. And uh, we think uh, that will have a, a major impact on, uh, on, on the market. Uh, but we need to address uh, housing affordability by uh, doing two things. One is, one is that, increase social housing investment. Uh, but secondly as well, we do need to address living standards, which is where our policy of secure work and lifting wages uh, will have an impact. Yeah, but how do you lift wages? Well, you lift wages by making sure that you don't have an undermining of existing wages and conditions by, for example, cowboy labour hire firms uh, undercutting uh, people. Uh, you lift wages by not having a, a two-phase economy. Some people who are working in the traditional economy, other people who are working in the gig economy, being not treated as employees, being treated as contractors when, for all intensive purposes, it is an employer employee relationship. You lift wages by addressing the issue of casualisation. You lift wages for women by making sure that they can participate in the workforce by giving proper support to the childcare system, by, by making childcare cheaper. In the event of a US-China conflict over Taiwan, isn't the Defence Minister Peter Dutton right that Australia will automatically follow whatever the US does based on the evidence of history going back 40 years, including under Labor governments? Well, you look at the position of the Biden administration, it's very different from the rhetorical position uh, that Peter Dutton has put forward. Uh, we maintain the same position as the United States and we think uh, that is sensible, that is support for the status quo. But that, that's, that's exactly my point, that whatever the US does, Australia does in lockstep. No. No. Well, what the US does is support for the status quo at the moment, and uh, they've consistently done that. That's been the situation which uh, the leadership of Taiwan have also uh, endorsed, and that is the position that we think is appropriate. In the election campaign, the Morrison government's case will probably go something like, we've steered Australia through the pandemic better than almost any other country in the world, comparatively very few deaths, and the economy is recovering well, so don't risk change. How will you counter that message? We'll counter it by saying this government's incapable of imagining a better future, let alone creating one. And we'll create one by having new industries, by taking advantage of cheaper, cleaner energy, which is there through our National Reconstruction Fund. We'll make work more secure. We'll defend living standards by making childcare cheaper, by defending and extending uh, Medicare as the centrepiece of our health system. Uh, we will uh, look forward as well as a nation. Uh, we're diminished why we don't recognise uh, First Nations people in our constitution and we're committed to the Uluru Statement from the Heart. But we're also committed to reforming the way that politics works in this country. To do so, you need a national anti-corruption commission. It's very clear that this government will never have one. The uh, Parliament's put out next year's sitting calendar and the federal budget is slated for March the 29th, which is earlier than you normally expect the budget, which is in May. What does that tell you about the timing of when the election will be? Well, it tells you that they'll either go after Australia Day and not have Parliament sit at all uh, for March 5th or March 12th, or they'll have uh, a budget and then go... Uh, on the following weekend. Uh, what it really tells us is that it's a reminder or a graphic demonstration of a government that doesn't have an agenda. They're only sitting uh, for a few days before the budget, uh, hardly sitting at all next year. It's likely, even if there's a budget, that we will sit a grand total of 10 days, 10 days the House of Reps and five days the Senate in the first six months of next year. Uh, this is a government that don't have an agenda for today, let alone one for tomorrow. And that's why they're out of time and don't deserve a second decade in office. We have an opportunity to grow back stronger 
after the pandemic. Australians have been magnificent and have made sacrifices and they deserve a government that looks to the future and, and creates a better future uh, for working Australians and helps to grow the middle class and addresses issues like the environmental challenge of climate change that understands it's an opportunity uh, to uh, really grow Australia and for us to be a renewable energy superpower in the, into the future. Before you go, in the 11 years that I've anchored this program, every political leader has agreed to do two primetime interviews on 7.30 during the federal election campaign. Are you willing to stick with that tradition in 2022? Oh, certainly, Leah. At, at least two. I will make the same invitation to the Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lee. And as it's the final sitting week of federal parliament for the year, we've also invited the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, to join us for an interview on 7.30 sometime this week when it's convenient for him.